I think we're good to go, Lena. Yeah, it's 12 o'clock noon. Uh, I can see there's still some people joining this uh, webinar for today. But I think we'll get started. We have a very interesting presentations ahead. Uh, I would like to welcome you all attending to this webinar organized by the Revafuel EU project. My name is Lena Nordgren and I'm working as a biofuel expert at Sekav in Arsusvik in Sweden, in northern parts of Sweden. This is an event today where I'll be the moderator and we had two very interesting speakers. And the event will focus on sustainable aviation fuel from residual softwood. And our presenters for today are Tino Lassmann, my colleague at SECAB, who is a pro project manager and senior process engineer. And our main speaker for today is Eva van Mastbergen, who works as a project lead within the Future Fuels team at Sky Energy. But first, I would like to give you some practical information for this webinar. This webinar is recorded, so by attending it, you approve of this recording that will be published afterwards. And if you do have some questions, which I very much hope you have for our speakers, both Eva and Tino, please write them in the chat and we will answer them at the end of this webinar. Uh, I think that's about it. And we'll start today's presentations to hear more about what the Revofuel project is and how we are working in the Revofuel project. So welcome, Tino. So, thank you very much, Lena, for this uh, very nice introduction. Um, as Lena said, I will be talking about uh, some general information on the project status of the Rebofuel project. The Rebofuel project, Rebofuel stands for Residual Softwood Conversion to High Characteristics Drop in Biofuels. It was started on the 1st June 2018, and due to the pandemic, uh, we extended uh, the length of the project until uh, the 30th June of uh, 2022. Uh, it is funded within the Horizon 2020 project, uh, Horizon 2020 program, and the budget, overall budget, was about uh, 20 million euro. And uh, EU contribution to this project uh, is about 14 million euro. The coordinator for the overall project is Global Bioenergies from France. Talking about uh, the partners of uh, the Revolution project, we, there are 11 partners involved coming from eight different countries. I have listed them here. So we have, as I said before, uh, the coordinator, which is Global Bioenergies, but we have as well Granul Invest, CCAP, Neste, uh, Energy Institute and the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, IPSB, Technip, Ashinimoto, Sky Energy, who are presenting today, Paya and Repsol. Uh, giving you an overview of the whole value chain or the whole project concept, uh, you can see here that uh, res uh, wood residuals are converted to hydrolysate and as well as lignin, or uh, let's say, yeah, or split. And then the hydrolysate is then further uh, uh, processed to isobutene as well as residual biomass, which are then uh, go then to a process uh, on Paneste uh, where gasoline is produced and jet fuel. And jet fuel we're going to talk about today. And uh, the residual biomass is uh, used for microbial protein uh, for feeding, for example. And uh, going back to the part with uh, the lignin, uh, lignin, one of the main applications, but not the only application of lignin, is uh, to use it uh, as a um, replacement for bitumen in asphalt. For in the process concept or the overall process itself, uh, the technical process integration is done by Technip and IPSB, and uh, global sustainability analysis of the value chain uh, is done by Energy Institute under Johannes Kepler State in Linz. What is the project ambition of the Revfuel project? So it is the production of high performance drop in biofuels from abundant residue and a high level of co product valorization. How are we going to do that? Uh, introducing is important to a unique stream of technologies into the market. And why are we doing this? Because we want to maximize long term economic, social, and environmental impact. That is the global ambition of the project. Then, of course, we have more uh, specific ambitions for the different process parts. 
for the wood to uh, to hydrolysate process, we want to increase the productivity by 10% and the economics of this process by 20. Uh, for the conversion from uh, hydrolysate to bio IBM, we want to improve the yield and the productivity. From bio IBM to biofuels, we want to have as good as a performance uh, as with fossil IBM, as well as selective uh, IC12 production for fuels. Microbial proteins for feed, it's important to optimize the feed formulation for animal feed. And for the lignin to bitumen part, we want to maximize lignin blending ratio while keeping specifications and quality that is required intact. There are uh, several ambitions just as uh, for the overall project, which is, for example, to evaluate the economic profitability, preparing the business plan for the future commercialization of the plant, it's important to optimize uh, performances and process parameters, um, benchmark the, uh, the wood hydrolysate bio IBN and the assessing crop product valorization, um, to provide an environmental and social sustainability, provide a conceptual scope uh, studies for the future conversation uh, scale plans, and also provide samples for testing and certification. Some of the impacts and barriers within this project, at least at the start of the project, we have the impacts such as the energy demand. One of the prerequisites was to 70% of the byproducts should be used for bioenergy. Of course, it's important to have high CO2 savings per megajoule of products. Uh, we also have techno-economic feasibility, uh, techno feasibility is necessary. So we want to reduce the cost of avoided CO2, increase the IIR, um, we want to create jobs, indirect jobs, direct jobs, uh, as well as constructing jobs. And uh, uh, we want a value chain with a high re uh, replicability. Regarding the barriers, uh, of course, feedstock provision is, is a, an important uh, topic. So societal acceptance and logistics using the feedstock we're using, as well as end user adoption. So performances and regular, uh, regulatory compliance, that's a barrier. But of course, there will be during this project, uh, um, there have been additional barriers uh, shown up and we will go through them uh, at the end of the project. So what are the object objectives and re uh, already achieved results for the different process parts? So for the demonstration of the production of residual wood hydrolysate and, uh, and uh, establishing a quality standard to feed uh, to the bio IBM fermentation unit, we have defined already specifications. The demo plant here in Anhaltsvik uh, in Sweden was upgraded uh, with an evaporation unit to be able to provide the sugars necessary. And of course, we have done uh, ton scale shipments um, that was then further used downstream in the process. Furthermore, for the uh, bio IBM to biofuel, uh, as I say, hydrolysate to bio IBM to biofuels uh, part of the process. Um, we want to demonstrate the production uh, of um, biofuels that are based on uh, wood, uh, residual wood hydrolysate uh, bio IBN uh, um, and uh, prepare it for a commercial scale. So we have done a su successful fermentation uh, up to pilot scale. Uh, first amounts of fuels have been produced in the conversion plant as well as uh, the certification process and fuel testing is ongoing. For the co-product valorization, for example, the valorization of lignin, uh, which was a uh, topic of uh, the previous uh, webinar, uh, we have shown that there's a high recovery of lignin. Uh, there were several uh, uh, test sections uh, paved by uh, PayUp in uh, Sweden, as well as we have assessed the microbial biomass for animal feed. And for the plant design, um, by Knip, uh, with, uh, it was important to determine and to validate the technical conditions to achieve uh, the safety, economic and environmental performances of the first of its kind commercial plant. So uh, an integrated design of all process units has been completed, a business plan has been established and the socio-economic assessment is already is at the moment ongoing. Coming back to the overview of uh, the whole value chain. Um, I want to show you that we will today uh, focus on the jet fuel part done by Sky Energy. And uh, there too, I uh, welcome Eva 
to present uh, this topic. Thank you very much, Tino. Uh, now we aim for our main topic of the day, just as Tino mentioned. The aviation industry is facing a major challenge, transitioning into a sustainable mode of transportation. And for this to happen, the production of large amounts of sustainable aviation fuel must start to take place today. And within the Riverfuel project, uh, a new value chain is demonstrated, just as Tina mentioned before, and evaluated very residues from the forest industry can be converted into second generation aviation fuel via an isobutene intermediate, which Eva will tell us more about. Eva van Mastbergen from Sky Energy. And Sky Energy is working with to source, produce, blend, and distribute sustainable aviation fuel. And Eva will also tell us some about the process to get an ASTM approval, which is very interesting. So welcome, Eva. Thank you, Lena. Let me pull up the presentation. I hope everybody can see this properly. So as Lena already introduced, uh, I will tell you a bit more about sustainable aviation fuels produced from isobutene. And of course, the first question is, why would we need sustainable aviation fuels? Well, we see three large challenges in the aviation industry coming up. So the first is that the passenger numbers will continue to grow even post COVID. So the expectation is that the aviation industry will recover from the COVID crisis by the year 2024, around that year. And passenger numbers are expected to grow up to 8 billion passengers per year in, in the next 20 years. Such a large growth also comes with a lot of carbon emissions. So the environmental impact of aviation industry is definitely significant. And if we don't do anything without any timely act action, the aviation industry could cons consume up to 22% of the global carbon budget by 2050. So of course, there's talk of environmental friendly alternatives. However, what we see currently is that the alternative propulsion methods such as hydrogen or electricity um, are not likely to be commercially available for long haul flights in the next coming decades. This, this will definitely happen, but it will take more time. So in the meantime, we want to reduce these emissions, but we cannot wait so long until these alternative propulsion methods are developed and commercially active, especially for these long haul flights, which are the main emitter of carbon um, in the aviation industry. So to address this problem, the aviation industry set up some targets. This, the first goal was to have carbon neutral growth from 2020 onwards. This has been changed to the levels from 2019 due to the COVID pandemic. Uh, with the recovery of the aviation industry by 2024, the schematic overview on the left will show what will happen with carbon emissions if we have no action at all, which is the dotted line on top, or if we would live up to these goals and start with carbon neutral growth, followed by a 50% reduction in 2050 compared to the levels of 2005. Well, you can see there's a large CO2 emission eruption to, to live up to. And this can be done via different ways. So there are ways to reduce these emissions via efficiency improvements, like new technologies, new engines, cleaner engines, different operations, shorter flight tracks, and changes of infrastructure. However, this will never reduce the levels of CO2 emissions to this 50% reduction goal. For that, we really need these alternative propulsion methods and um, offsetting systems schematics, but mainly sustainable aviation fuels. So what is such a sustainable aviation fuel? What does it look like? Well, it has to be compatible with the current fleet of our aircraft. So it has to be a fully drop-in fuel that can be used in every type of aircraft that's currently operational and can be used in all infrastructure. It has to be sustainable because we want to have a CO2 reduction. So it has to be an actually sustainable alternative. Uh, it needs to be certified for use. So it so it's certified as a drop-in fuel. This is done via ACM approval. And of course, ideally you have a fuel which is cost competitive, so the uptake will be much larger. But we see there are multiple challenges in the sustainable aviation fuel or SAF supply chain. The first one is the feedstock. So where fossil fuels use a fossil crude oil, which is found deep in the, within the ground, we need to have a sustainable feedstock we can use. And these feedstock types are, the, availab the availability of these feedstock types are limited. And you need to guarantee that they are sustainably sourced and managed. So there's a challenge there. We also see a challenge with the conversion technologies. So the challenge is that there are not so many SAF production routes. 
they need to be HTM certified, which is an ex extensive and expensive process. process. Um, and there's also a mis mismatch between the technologies that are already mature, that are already maturated, but they don't match with the large amount of sustainable feedstock that is available. So new technology needs to be developed um, for us to be able to produce a large amount of sustainable aviation fuels for the next coming decades, which of course is a very costly process. With that, you'll create a price premium of sustainable aviation fuels compared to conventional jet fuels. And this is also a challenge because, of course, for airlines, they would like to see a pr price parity between fossil jet fuels and sustainable fuels. So we need to find a way to cover this price premium. And these challenges has led to the development that there is currently not a lot of SAF production capacity available. So there's one facility in the US, World Energy, that produces sustainable aviation fuel on a continuous basis. There's also a facility in Finland uh, that's producing batches of SAF uh, as well. Um, but that's it at this moment in time. So there's more production capacity being developed, and that's mostly, mostly following the developments in policy. So what we see in Europe is a lot of discussion ongoing about sustainable aviation fuels and whether they should be mandated. So Norway was the first to set up a mandate for sustainable aviation fuels, requiring all uh, aviation fuel use in the, in the country to have a certain amount of sustainable aviation fuel blended in it. And these discussions are extending towards other EU countries and even led to the Refuel EU Aviation Initiative, where there's talk of an EU-wide mandate. So the demand will be here, and now we need to come up with enough production capacity and sustainable resources to produce sustainable aviation fuel. So that's where also where Sky Energy comes in. Uh, we started, we were founded 10 years ago, and we started basically with developing this market. So we started with sourcing SAF. Where is it produced? Where can we find it? Is it sustainable? Can we guarantee it's sustainably sourced, produced, um, and blended, and then delivered into the, into wing? So what we what we took up was all the paperwork around it, sourcing the staff, uh, guaranteeing quality assurance, blending, and into fuel delivery, but also develop programs to co-fund the premium that exists for staff over fossil fuels, and of course, very much with the eye on sustainability. And later on, we also transitioned into a more long-term focus. So we announced the development of the first SAF production plant in the EU called DSL-1. Um, so we're making the switch from being a trader in sustainable aviation fuel to becoming a producer. I'll tell a little bit more about DSL-1 in a few slides. But we're also involved with a lot of different um, technology developments, so novel SAF projects, such as the railway fuel project that we're talking about today. Uh, apart from these, these R&D projects, we're also looking at to set up new direct supply lines in the EU and in North America. And we are, as a company, technology agnostic. So we are not bound to one type of technology, but we are really looking into the different technologies that are out there and which are most suitable for different geographic locations and with different types of sustainable feedstock that are available at these locations. So over the last decade, we've built up quite an extensive track record. We su supplied over 30 airlines on all continents. We've collaborated with many industry partners. Um, like I mentioned, we started founded in 2010. We quickly afterwards set up a sustainability board, which is an independent board and that advises us on all our uh, DSL tracks, whether the feedstock and the process is sustainable. So uh, that that's involves different NGOs, academia, WWF, uh, different companies just looking into the sustainability of the supply chains. We are also RSB certified, so that's from the round, uh, round table of sustainable biomaterials, guaranteeing all our staff supply chains are sustainable. sustainable. Um, and later on, we also announced the Board Now program. We first collaborated with KLM on our corporate biofuel program, and now we have our own program known as Board Now which allows corporate travelers to travel on SAF and with that lower the company's um, CO2 emissions. So if you want to learn more about that, I would urge you to visit www.boardnow.org. Um, as I mentioned, in 2019, we announced the DSL-1 project and later on also announced some other new capacity projects, which also include two sustainable aviation fuel projects known as Syncero and Zenit. And this is a slide on the facility that we're building, so that's DSL-1. It will be the first dedicated SAF production facility in the world. Um, we'll, we'll produce around 100 kiloton SAF a year. It will be in the north of the Netherlands, in Delft-South. On the right side, you will see a picture of the Delft-South chemical cluster, 
where it's located. We aim to have a CO2 reduction of over 85% with the final sample we produce in this facility. And then the reason why we're all here, of course, we are seeking ACM approval of the SAF that is produced by Global Bioenergies within this Ray of Fuel project. And that is our role within the project. So I'll, I'll give you a quick update on the fuel that is produced in the project, but also the ACM approval process. So first of all, why is this necessary? Well, if you produce a state aviation fuel, it needs to be blended and certified for use. For use. So the first batch of NEED SAF that's produced need to cohere the specifications written down in ACM DSM 566, which is a se separate standard for aviation fuels that are synthetically made, so all non-fossil type of fuels. And this um, certification contains different annexes explaining the different approved pathways. So there are seven pathways approved and they all have a separate annex. If you have a first batch of needs have produced, it needs to cohere the specifications written down for your production pathway in that specific annex. For each annex, there's a different blending percentage allowed. So the fuel is blended most of the time up to 50% with conventional jet fuel. This conventional jet fuel is typically certified via ACTMs D1655. If then the fuel is blended, you'll have a SAF blend that needs to be certified as well, according to the standards of the specifications written down in table one of the D7566. So that's, those are the specifications for a blend of fuel containing synthetic uh, aviation fuel together with conventional jet fuels. And if it meets these specifications, which are typically more stringent than the ones that exist for um, conventional jet fuel, it's automatically recertified as a 1655 fuel. So that means that as soon as you have the SAF blend and meets specifications in this table one of D7566, it's automatically considered as a standard conventional jet fuel. That makes it a drop-in fuel that can be used in all types of aircraft and infrastructure worldwide that could that make use of these standard uh, jet fuels. So as I already quickly mentioned, there are currently seven SAF production routes ACTM approved. They depend on different types of conversion processes, and with these different types of conversion processes come different types of feedstocks that are being used. So the SAF that is currently out on the market is produced via the HEFA process. That's an Annex 2. And that's basically the same process that's being used for renewable diesel production. And so they, they take up different types of fats, oils, and greases, typically waste oils, to produce a renewable diesel and, and sit by aviation fuel. And this type of SAF is, is allowed to be used, blended up to 50% with conventional jet fuel. There's another interesting pathway in here, and that's Annex 5, and that's the alcohol to jet pathway. And I'll go a little bit more into detail on that later on as well, because it's very relevant for the railway fuel project. And the alcohol to jet pathway starts with an alcohol and produces SAF from that. And these alcohols can be produced most of the time from sugars via fermentation process. Alcohol to jet SAF is also allowed uh, for usage up to, blended up to 50% with conventional jet fuel. And as you can imagine in this picture, you have different types of perversion methods, you have different types of feedstocks are being used, and therefore all the types of different, different types of SAF that originate from these processes have different uh, CO2 savings. So it's really specific for your production uh, plant, for the feedstock you use, the conversion technique you use, and the layout of your plant, how much CO2, CO2 reduction you can actually achieve with your final product. So to go into detail a little bit more on the alcohol to jet SAF, it's certified currently either from, the, from ethanol or from isobutanol. So those two types of alcohols are allowed to be used as a feedstock for SAF production. On the top level, you'll see what it looks like if you produce SAF from isobutanol and bottom from ethanol. The process is very similar. So you start with an alcohol. This alcohol is then dehydrated to remove a water and um, produce an alkene or an oligomer. So you'll see on the top, this is isobutene and an ethylene for the ethanol process. Um, these alkenes are then are oligomerized to produce longer chain hydrocarbons, carbons, which are still unsaturated. So I've put in an example of two different types of isomeric C12 structures. And then these isomeric structures go into um, a different step. It's going to 
there are two, two more steps, fractionation and hydrogenation. And when in fractionation or basically distillation, you extract the jet fuel cuts hydrocarbons that are in your products to produce the saffron. And with the hydrogenation, you add hydrogen to your process to saturate the bonds and produce um, hydrocarbons at the end. So in the end, you'll see I've put in three different examples. So these are just examples. Jet fuel contains much more different types of, of hydrocarbons. But these are three, three different types of isomeric C12 structures that could be found in a jet fuel. So this is a picture already shown by Tino. So the rare fuel staff is made from isobutene intermediate, starting from the root residue. Global Bioenergy has developed a process to ferment the types of sugars, including the root sugars, to a gas phase isobutene. This isobutene intermediate product is then upgraded to a jet fuel. And as you might have already noticed, this is very, very similar to the isobutanol alkyl to jet pathway. So this is a picture showing on the left in the gray bar, the um, alkyl to jet simple aviation fuel produced from isobutanol. And basically what we do within the radio fuel process is that we skip one step. So where the isobutanol alkyl to jet immediately produces the, where produces the isobutanol from via fermentation, Global Bioenergies produces isobutene via fermentation and therefore skips the step where dehydration is necessary. So it's immediately produced the isobutene, which can then be upgraded uh, to SAF, phyto oligomerization, fractionation, and hydrogenation steps. So if you look at this picture, you can imagine the final product is also very similar. Both SAFs are very rich in C12 and C16 hydrocarbons, since we start with a C4 hydrocarbons, it's always a multitude of four. And they're fully isoparaffinic. So with these results, we seek ACM inclusion of this type of, of production pathway uh, in NX5 of these N5 exists together with the alcohol to jet pathway. So this ACM approval process is quite extensive. Um, it requires a, a very extensive evaluation process, which is described in ACM D4054. And this occurs in very close collaboration with original engine manufacturers, original equipment manufacturers, just such as Airbus, Boeing, Rolls-Royce, Honeywell, and also the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. So they developed a test program, which consists of four different tiers in which different tests are being performed. The first, tier one and tier two, uh, they're more small scale laboratory kind of analysis. So tier one is really uh, measurements like density, viscosity, freeze point. And within tier two, you look more at hydrocarbon composition, the distillation profile, uh, measurements such as viscosity or density versus temperature, but also the storage stability of the product you finally produce and the compatibility of this product with other additives that are commonly used for jet fuels. So the first two tiers require smaller volumes of fuel to be analyzed. It's around 40 liters for tier one, around 320 liters for tier two. And if you have this data available for your tier one and tier two process, you can write this down in a data report summarizing the tier one and tier two data. This will be internally reviewed by the OEMs and the FAA, and they will provide you with some feedback and their thoughts on the fuel. This can either be that they say this is not a jet fuel at all. Please stop this certification process. That's not very likely. Most of the time, you're already in, in, in a good track, but they might want to see some more data. So if, um, if there are concerns about the quality of your fuel, they request to have additional data in the tier three or the tier four testing program. And these are much more extensive and therefore require a much larger amount of fuel. So in the tier three, it's a combustor rig testing. It also looks at the, the, the engine infrastructure, fuel nozzles, fuel pumping. Uh, and if you're unlucky and you have to proceed to tier four testing, this can be a real engine testing and therefore consuming a lot of time a lot of money and a lot of volumes of fuel. So if you go into this ACM approval process, it's def definitely needed to be able to show you can produce larger volumes of fuel. Um, of course, you can start the tier one testing with smaller volumes, but it's definitely recommended to have a sort of pilot installation. You can produce a couple of hundred liters of fuel to really evaluate the fuel properly. All the data combined then, if you continue to tier three and tier four data as well, is combined in the ACM research support. This will again be reviewed by the OEMs and the FAA. And if they approve, you can go continue and go up for ballots. So if you go up for ballot in the ACM community, everybody can have a say uh, 
uh, whether they accept or reject the research support or especially the specification, uh, the updated specification in HTM. And there is, it's good to know that the negative votes can only be based on technical requirements. So it is not allowed to bring in a negative vote stating that approval would bring another company in a competitive advantage compared to yours. That will be withdrawn. You need to have a technical reasoning why you think it's not safe to use this fuel in your equipment, your engine, or, or there may be that you miss some, some information in the research report or something is not clear to you. Then that could mean there'll be an additional testing involved or just some clarifications added to the research reports and go up for ballot again. If it's then approved, the ACM specifications will be adjusted with this new information added. And in this case, a new annex. So of course, what do you want to know? How much is our fuel like the isobutanol alkyl jet sap? And I think in view of the time, I'll keep it short. On the left side, you see a picture of the isoparaffin distribution of alcohol to jet safs and the isobutene saf from river fuel. So the river fuel fuels are in orange. There are two different samples, one from the laboratory and one from the pilot installations, which is operational and built during the river fuel project. And in the green, you see the two alcohol to jet pod weights, the, the lighter green being the ethanol alcohol to jet and the darker green being the isobutanol alcohol to jet. And you can very clearly see that the hydrocarbon distribution of the global energies isobutene SAF is very, very similar to isobutanol alcohol to jet. So it's a very great result. We see around 80% isomeric C12 structures and around 15% isomeric C16 structures. And then what would this look like in the final jet fuel blend? So on the right side, you see the blended isobutene SAF. Uh, this is the laboratory sample, which is blended with a jet A1 that's been um, supplied by our project partner Repsol from Spain. And of course, a conventional jet fuel contains more different types of hydrostructures than just isoparaffinic structures. They contain normal paraffins, isoparaffins, cycloparaffins, but also aromatics. Um, as you can see on the right, this is what this hydrocarbon distribution looks like. And if you blend it for 50% with the isobutene SAF, you'll see larger peaks at the C12 and C16 carbon numbers for the isoparaffins. This makes so much sense because you blend it for 50% with just isoparaffins. Um, if you see this picture, you might think, wow, that's a lot of the same molecule being involved in the jet fuel. That's not the case. These are different types of isomeric structures, but they just have the same carbon number. So, of course, there are much more other parameters that are very important for the evaluation of a new type of jet fuel. And we don't have the time to discuss them all. I think it might also be a little bit boring for you. So I picked out a few which I think are quite important. On the left, you see the desolation profile. Again, in orange, the isobutene pathways, and in green, the alcohol to jet pathways. The lighter green being the ethanol, and the darker green being the isobutanol alcohol to jet. And the, in the desolation profile, you see two black lines. These black lines, they show the um, um, targets set by the ACM, ACM community of the experience they have with alternative jet fuels. So, Everything between those two black lines is type of fields where they are familiar with, basically. So that's a good sign. It's um, they target new stabilization fields to fall within these two lines, and ours does. That's a, as a good result. And there are of course other parameters which are important, such as fl flash point density, freeze point, thermal stability, and our fuel behaves very well on all these specifications. It's very promising and it's in line with all the specifications as set by D7566 NX5 for alcohol to jet, jet fuels. There is one little hiccup and those are the trace elements that are not allowed to have any trace elements in any system aviation fuels um, for a maximum of 0 0.1 milligram per kilogram or PP1, PPM. And our samples showed small amounts of phosphorus and silicon uh, traces. So we have to figure out what origin is of those and fix that while we continue in the ACM process. So where do we start to stand today? Uh, we have developed, we have evaluated the fuel. We are gathering all the data to produce the tier one and to do data reports. We have most of the tier one specification properties available already. We're still waiting on a few results and we're also exper expecting the tier two results to arrive soon. Um, in the next coming months, we'll expect to have all these results available. 
We will then combine this in the Steel 1 and Tier 2 data reports, which will have finalized before the end of this year. And then it can be reviewed by the OEMs in the first quarter of the next year. The pilot installation is already operational, so it's running semi-continuously. And if we need any more additional batches of fuel, we can just produce them and analyze them and continue the research. So we are very confident at the moment that we can have this OEM review in the beginning of next year. And if the OEMs and FAA are positive uh, during this review process, there's even a chance that the inclusion of isoptin staff in NX5 Alcott's jet might go off a ballot for the ending of the rail fuel project. So on that positive note, that was it. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Eva. Very, very interesting presentation. Uh, we have one question in the chat room now. I remind you to please write your questions in the chat room for both Tino and Eva. But I think we'll we'll start directly with the, the, the one question we have. The, the ASTM process is very extensive and very uh, extensive and big, I would say. And I, I guess it takes quite a lot of time. How much time does it take in normal, yeah. in general? Yeah, it really depends on the process you're looking at. So the um, first process always take up a much longer period of time because it's also mm. new for the OEMs and the FAA. And mm. now they've gained a lot of experience on, on these type of alternative jet fuels. So if you produce a jet fuel that's already similar to some to a pathway that's already approved, um, then it can go very quickly. There's also now a fast track approach. So if you have a fuel that is within the experience of the OEMs, um, they developed targets, basically target values for all the analysis. And if you're in line with these target values, you can apply for a fast track approval process. They could go a lot quicker. It requires less volume of fuel. However, you can you are only allowed if you get approved via the fast track process for blending up to 10%. So not more than 10% of staff is allowed in fast track uh, okay. approval process. And in that sense, if you have a fuel which is very similar to already existing pathways like we do, it's more worth your efforts to go for the full inclusion because then you can go up to 50% blending and you don't have to do that after the fast track approval process anymore. And it might okay. even take up the same amount of time if it's so similar and everything goes I well. think that very much covers also the question from Darren Carty. He, he asked you, does every new manufacturing facility undergo the full ASTM? And you cover this in, this, uh, in your answer. Yeah, uh, maybe and also to add on Darren's question. So if you're yeah. building a new manufacturing facility based on already approved pathways, such as Fisher mm -hmm. Shops or HEFA, you don't have to apply for ASTM approval of your facility mm -hmm. uh, you just need to your fuel just need to meet meet the specifications set for that pathway so yeah specification good. yeah for that annex yeah and i think that's very important for for the uh, development of aviation fuel sustainable aviation fuel we need quite a lot of volume we're going to reach this 50 percent reduction target until 2050 we need volumes Absolutely. Um, and darren also darren cartier also has another question uh, would biomass to fuel energy conversion rates, would you rate it at 50% or so? And what kilogram of softwood equals one kilogram of SAF? Thank you. That is a good question. I'm not sure. I don't have the numbers available at this stage. I think that's something that Globe Energy is looking into. Um, mm. Tina, I'm not sure if you have any insights on that as well. Uh, I think we could we can we can uh, answer that question then by email. Um, I don't have any actual number at the moment either. I think uh, a good idea is for Tina and Eva to write your email addresses in the chat room. Uh, so those of you who have direct questions can also have contact with Eva and Tino afterwards this seminar. Uh, we have one more question here. Uh, will the pilot in the Netherlands, I assume Bengt Alden is talking about the DSL-01 pilot, produce isobutene if approved? Um, no, so the, the facility that we're building in the Netherlands is really a commercial scale uh, mm. production facility, and they will use the HAFA process. So, so we'll use waste mm. oils for the production of that, uh, mm. and not an isobutene intermediate. The pilot that's operational within a rail fuel project that is producing SAF from isobutene, uh, that's situated in France, I believe in Lyon. 
Mm -hmm. yes. um, yeah, very good. Perfect. And uh, when will you start produce large volumes in, uh, in this facility in the Netherlands? It's still uncertain. So we're now finalizing the feed mm -hmm. phase. And yep. um, I'm not working in the, the team DSL, so I'm not sure what's the latest update on the, okay. the commissioning date, basically. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Uh, we'll have one further question. Uh, it's really nice to have questions for both Eva and Tino. What are the advantages of wood to jet via isobutene versus FT conversion? I think that's a question for both of you. Yeah, it's it's different routes. I would say Fisher Chops has a lot of of challenges. Um, so there's not yet a Fisher Chops facility operational starting from biomass for the production of SAF. Mm. So they're on development. Uh, there are some setbacks in this in this development phase as well. And so we're still waiting for the first Fisher Chops facility to, facilities to produce SAF. Um, Typically, I would say the isopatine to, to jet pathway is more efficient, so the carbon efficiency is, is higher. Um, Tina, I'm not sure if you have any additions to that. No, I think covers it uh, very well. So I think it's important to at, at least to use the wood hydrolysate, uh, to use the sources you have, and especially mm -hmm. talking about Sweden, which has a, a high amount of wood available. Or at least say uh, wood residues available for the utilization for uh, biofuels as well as jet fuels. Yeah, thank thank you very much. And we have a lot of sustainable biomass also available. So and we should use it in a sustainable matter. Um, get a high value out of the residues we do have. Uh, are there some more questions? Please write in the chat room. Give it a couple of seconds. Otherwise, I'll just uh, tell you that uh, in October, we're going to have the next Forever Fuel webinar. That will be about bio-based gasoline with the Repsol, another project partner in the Forever Fuel project. And we'll see if there's some further questions. No, not yet. Um, so on uh, the beginning of October, we will have our next Fuel webinar and please sign up for that as well. We'll get out with further information directly after the summer. So follow Fuel on social media. We are both on Twitter and LinkedIn. So you can see when we put out the agenda and uh, the, the registration link for that webinar. And this webinar today, thank you very much, Tino. Thank you, Eva, and thank you everyone for attending this webinar. This webinar, as I mentioned in the beginning, is recorded and will be published on, uh, you can find it through the Revofuel website, revofuel.eu, or on the social media for Revofuel, LinkedIn and Twitter. So follow us on social media and uh, look out for the next uh, webinar that will be held in this autumn. So now I'd like to thank you all very much. Uh, just check once once more if there are more questions. No, just a thank you very much comment. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I wish you all a very nice summer and thank you for attending this webinar today. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.